All right, wherever you are joining us from right now, if you're ready for the word, type or say ready. All right. Put your hand up if you got a seat next to you so some people coming in won't be so mad. We are Zion Music. They say they're ready. Let's give them musically what they're about to hear verbally. back to Genesis chapter 2 where it all began we're gonna pick up where we left off last week in Genesis chapter 2 if you have access to a Bible electronically or digitally digital and play does the same thing or manually you can turn there now if you want to follow along on your device or your Bible uh, if not it's okay the verse is gonna come on the screen and as is our custom I'm gonna ask you if you're physically able to stand without harm to yourself that you stand for the reading of the Word of God for this message. I promise you, you won't be standing long because I'm only going to read one verse to you to set the stage for today's conversation. Verse 18 of Genesis chapter 2, as we're now in Adam's family part 3. Verse 18 says, from the New Living Translation, let the Lord... Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Mm. Just right for him. Yeah. Before you sit back down, please repeat this after me. Lord, Lord. what's just right for me? You may be seated. Yeah, what's just right? for me. You gave Adam what was just right for him. And since Adam is our case study for this series, then what's just right for me? You're the same God yesterday, today, and forever. You're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're the God of Adam. You're my God. So since you gave Adam what was just right for him, would you please give me what's just right for me? I want what's just right for me financially. I want just what's just right for me academically. I want what's just right for me professionally. I want what's just right for me relationally. Does anybody feel that way? God, I want what's just right for me. Before I get into that content, I'm going to be talking about generally two things. If I were to summarize this message, I'm going to be talking about Adam's resources and I'm going to talk about his relationship. Before I get into his relationship, I want to talk about his resources because that was just right for him. God didn't just give him a wife that was just right for him. God also gave him a profession and a career that was just right for him. Adam's work, he was created for that work. That was the work he was designed to do. And one of the things we talked about last week when we talked about handling your business is that Adam had a job that he was built for. His job was to tend and take care of the garden. He watched over it. He took care of it. He was responsible for it. And there was a river running through that garden that that turned in, broke off into four rivers or streams or branches. So not only did he have the river of a the river in Eden, not only did he have a job, but he also had access, opportunity access to these other streams, these other things that could provide resources into his life. And I said to you on last week, we need to make sure that we're watering the garden of our lives with multiple ways in which we can be resourced. So we should be saying, just like in Adam's situation, God, give me the job and the profession and the career that's just right for me. Like when you do the work you were designed to do, it just fits. I'm tired of just doing what pays the most or what makes me popular. I'm tired of just doing what I have to do. God, let me do what I was born to do. Let me do not what just will make everybody proud of me. Make me do what will please you because it's what I was built to do. 
And then also I would encourage you to go back and listen to that teaching around those streams because each one of those streams, Lord, show me which stream works for me. Show me what my, my Pishon should be. My Pishon, what it should be my steady increase. What, what, kind of, what kind of stream or opportunity can I get in that resources me in more than one way? What is my Gihon, Lord? What is the idea that is bursting with opportunity in my life? Show me what, what the Gihon stream is for me. What is right for me? Show, me? show me where I'm supposed to go with that. Show me what my Tigris River is. What is the Tigris River for me that gives me rapid increase or rapid return on investment that is also legal? Let me put that out there. Like, like everything, everything Adam has at his disposal is legal. And I, I want to say this. I want to say this. I'm not trying to put anybody down. If anybody is doing something illegal to make money, if you would use the same mental acuity that you're using to do something wrong and use it to do something right, you may not get it as fast, but you'll live longer. And your family won't be worried about you all the time. And your life won't always be at risk. And your freedom won't be always at risk. Is, watch this. Is the, is, is the risk, is the reward worth the risk? And I'm saying God has a way to make you wealthy and to give you success without you having to look over your back all the time. So, so what, is, what is my tigers? What is my Euphrates stream, sweet waters? What is, it, what is it something that I enjoy doing that could become an income stream into my life? And so, so, so just ask God, like, what is right for me? I'm going to say one more thing about resources before I go into his relationships. And that is, in this in, in, in this world, there are basically four income-producing categories, four income categories. Now, I got this board. This board is actually the Extreme Children's Church board. These jokers in Children's Church got a daggone smart board. I've been writing on flip charts and white paper up here, and we the one paying the bills, and they got, I done stole this. They will never see this again, ever. This will go home. I'm going to pack this up and put it in my book bag. Like, this is off the chain. I don't even know how to use it right, but this is off the chain. So, so ESBI. Thank y'all for reducing the size of the letter. If the one, is, one of the ways you can make income is by being an employee. Or you can do it by being self-employed. Or you can do it through investing. Being an investor. Or you can be a business owner. Now, when you're, when, all of these are fair. Let me do this. Let me do this. Let me call it. How you like that? <laughs> Boom. Getting fancy on them people. I don't really have to write. I just like to make me feel smart when I do this. <laughs> so, 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 so when you're an employee, this is your river. What makes it a river? It's, it's usually something stable. It's steady. You get paid monthly or biweekly or weekly. It usually gets you get something called PTO or paid time off. It comes with benefits, right? So it is something, it is something stable that you have, and it means you actually are on a job. You are on, that's R, on a job. Man, that's hard to write. That's messed up. I gotta clean that up. Clear strong. Okay. What? All right, boom, boom. Mm-hmm. I'll be better next time. You are on a job. That means you work for someone else. You work for somebody. When you are self-employed, it means, simply means you own a job. Now, we can say you own a company, you own a business, but actually, more than likely, you're the sole proprietor of that company. So you own a job. That means you don't work for, uh, you don't work for somebody else. You work for yourself. Now, the difference between these two is you probably don't have benefits. You may not have PTO. So it's 100% performance-based income. If you don't work, you don't get paid. It's not a bad thing, but it comes with risk. You understand me? If you're a business owner, you don't work for somebody and you don't work for yourself. Others work for you. 
And what you own is you own a system. And that system accelerates or leverages your growth. The difference is because you have people who work for you, you can you, they 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 make you they make you money. Now, business owners do tend to work very hard. But because they own the system, even when they're not working, other people are working and the system is working that's generating income from them. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then an investor is a person, you don't, you don't, uh, you're not on a job, you don't own a job, you, own, you don't own a system, you own a, an investment portfolio and your money is working for you. In your investment portfolio, it could be stocks, it could be mutual funds, it could be EFTs, it could be commodities, it could be real estate, but it, it could be cash. It has to be something that's generating money for you. Are you tracking with me? And this is the most, this is the most, the easiest way to gain passive income is through investing because you are making money while you're not working, while you're doing something else. Now, here's what I want you to understand. 90% of people in the world make their money as an employee or a self-employed person. Only 10% of people in the world are either business owners. That means that you don't just own a job, you own a system. You have employees, you have HR situations, you got compliance issues, you got a finance department, you got all these uh, um, procedures and policies. It's, it's a lot to it, but that's 10% that of the world of business owners or investors. But here's the challenge. 90% of the world's wealth is housed between business owners and investments, investors. Only 10% of the world's wealth is housed with employees and self-employed people. And the Bible says in Deuteronomy 8.18 that God has given us power to gain wealth. So I'm saying at some point we got to start thinking of if I'm an E or I'm an S, how do I get over here? Now, everybody's not built to be a business owner. I don't know why that's coming up. Maybe you're not built to be a business owner, but everybody can learn how to invest. You have got to find a way to make money make money for you legally. You got to find a way to do that because what ends up happening is you end up putting so much pressure on your employer. Well, y'all need to give me a raise. Y'all need to give me a bonus. You need to, let me tell you something. I said it at 945. I'm going to say it in here again. I don't know how it's going to land, but I'm saying it. I don't have to say it, but I'm saying it to make a point. I'm telling you, I've lived this. For 16 years between 2007 and 2023, between 2007 and 2023, I started this church in 2000. Between 2007 and 2023, I only got two raises as the pastor of this church. And it was nobody's fault. I never requested one. During that whole time, people who worked here, they got promoted, they got raises, they got increases. Two times between 2017, 2007 and 2023, 16 years, I had a pay adjustment. Twice. You know why? Because that whole, and I never was living bad. Because that whole time in those 16 years, I always had other ways that I made money. You have to learn how to have, yeah, I'm not even saying to brag, I'm just telling you the truth, right? I'm not complaining or anything. And you got to have a life that's like that in your life so that you're not putting pressure on people who are not responsible for your wealth. You are, the only, people you work for are responsible for giving you a seed. That's what a salary is, a seed. It is your responsibility to take that seed and plant it into something that will bring you a harvest. Oh, you got to find a way to harvest your seed so that it can turn into something. All right? So now that's on you. So, so God, what's, what, what is right for me? What, 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 what on here is right for me? Because he expects you. God wants you to prosper. I believe that. Now, now, now that we talked about resources, let's talk about relationships. Go to verse 18 where it says, the Lord God said, it is not good for this man to be alone. Now wait, God, he's got a job. He's got a relationship with you. He knows his purpose. He knows what he's supposed to be doing. And God says it's still not good because he's missing something that will help him with his purpose. Watch this, watch this. See, Adam's purpose, you go back to chapter one, part of his purpose was be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He can't do that by himself. He cannot reproduce alone. He needs a spouse. 
So watch this. Here's the point. When it comes to Adam's being alone, Adam being alone, it was more an issue of purpose than an issue of preference. Adam going from being single to going to being married was more about purpose than preference. It wasn't because he was just saying, I just want to be booed up. It's because he said, I can't fulfill my purpose without being married. And I want to say to every single person, you need to start putting purpose over preference. Like, because if you get married out of preference, it would be a tragedy to have your preference met, but miss out on your purpose. Because what if your purpose doesn't even require a spouse? I'm just saying, I'm not saying getting married is a bad thing, but make sure it's something you want to do and not something you're trying to make somebody else happy because your mother keeps saying she want a grandchild and she want to see you walk down the aisle. I mean, your mother got to get over herself. Because you're trying to please somebody, and now you're going to walk down the aisle and marry somebody so that they can feel better. So now their puzzle is complete, but they don't have to live with what you got to live with because you settled because you wanted to make somebody happy. I'm saying it's got to be more about purpose than preference. Don't miss your purpose trying to please somebody. You understand what I'm saying? This is so important because people are being pressured into getting married. When it should be about purpose. Adam, Adam, I need Eve to help me fulfill my purpose. Now watch this. There, Gary Smalley said, there are three questions you need to answer before you get married. Here are the three questions. Who is my master? What is my mission? Then who is my mate? In that order. Who is my master? Should be God. Head of my life. The Lord. What is my mission? What was I put on this earth to do? What is my assignment? What is my purpose? What is my calling? What is the meaningful work that I want to invest my life in? Then I'm ready for a mate. That was, that was the order with Adam. Like before Adam got a mate, he already had a relationship with God. God talks to him. God breathed into him. God gave him direction. And he already knows his mission. This is your assignment. If you don't know who your master is and your mission is and you get a mate, you're going to put them in confusion. You, 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 this is so important because, because there's, everybody say alignment. There should be alignment. If God is first in your life, then it should be first in the person's life that you're trying to connect with. Like to not have spiritual unity is going to be a problem. Stop compromising and going with preference. So you know this person doesn't believe like you believe, but they got good hair and you think the kid's going to look good. You got to grow up now. Just because y'all look good in your pictures on Instagram don't mean this is the one. Do y'all believe the same? Do y'all have shared faith beliefs? This person doesn't even believe. You read the Bible every day. You love God's word. They say the Bible been tampered with. They don't even mess with the Bible. And now, instead of that being a red flag, you just think it's something you're going to work around. Well, we love each other. And, and, and as we get married, you think they're going to start coming to church. with No, they're not. You're going to come to church by yourself. She ain't going to come to church with you. You're going to come to church by yourself. You come to church by yourself because people show you their best when they're dating. If she didn't come to church with you while you were dating with her best foot forward, ain't no way in the world she coming to church with you after you get married. You're coming to church by yourself. And you're going to walk up to church by yourself and some sister on the usher board going to say, why are you always by yourself? And then next week, you're going to take your ring off and say, I don't know why I'm by myself. <laughs> Let me tell you something. God, if you're really serious about God, there is nothing and no one more important in your life than your relationship with God. And the most important thing in my life, we can't even talk about. When you compromise on that, your whole marriage will be one compromise after another, after another, to after a while it starts getting, it starts getting exhausting. That's why the Bible says don't be unequally yoked. It is hard. Do you know, ooh, y'all getting the best I got all day. When you see two oxen that are yoked together, Remember, his yoke is, and his burden is light. One of the ways the yoke, that would, the oxen would be yoked together because they would work together. And they would rough out the, the yoke so that there was equality of work. So that when the, yoke, when the oxen would plow the field, there would be straight furrows. The, the yoke had to be equal so that the furrow would be straight. If the yoke was off balance, then what would naturally happen is the furrows would go in circles. Right? So the, the oxen don't know. They just going like this. But they don't know because the thing is unequal. They just going like this. 
So they're supposed to be doing straight lines, but they're going like this. And I'm saying the reason why some of y'all keep going in circles in your life because you're not yoked up with somebody who you're equally... You got me going in circles. Dun, 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 dun. Going round and round. But let's just say that you can check the master box. Oh, we're on the same page. We believe the same thing. We'd be praying together and everything. That still doesn't mean the mission is aligned. There are a lot of relationships that are not master friendly. There are a lot of relationships that are not mission friendly. So you can be at the same church, but not. Then when you talk about, well, this is what I feel led to do with my life. This is what I feel called to do in my life. This is what I feel my purpose is. And you start talking to your next, well, this is what I feel my purpose is. This is what I feel aligned to do. And you say, this ain't going to work. How are we going to make this work? But some people are so pressed over preference, they will say, you know what? I'll tell you what. By the way, by the way, if you're in a relationship with somebody you're dating and they don't take your mission serious, if they minimize your mission, if they try to talk down about it like it ain't a big deal, and they got their best foot forward, that's a sign. They're not going to be down with you and supportive of your mission after you get married. If they don't, they, they don't feel it's important while you get married. So what you're going to do is you're going to compromise. You're going to get married over preference. And then your only mission in that relationship is to be their spouse. And I'm saying you don't think God's best for you, what's right for you, is somebody you can be mutually supportive of each other's missions and assignment. You don't think that's God's best? We're missing mission and assignment. Trying to get hooked up with somebody because you say, you know what? Well, I can't be picky because everybody won't take somebody with kids. Somebody say, Lord, what's right for me? What's right for me? I know everybody say this to right. What's right for me? You know. What I love about God is he picked, he picked Adam's wife. In fact, in fact, watch this, watch this. He picked Adam's wife. Adam didn't even have a choice in it. He, he selected her. Go to verse 18. I'm going to keep going here. In verse 18, uh, it says, the Lord God said it's not good for the man to be alone. Who said it? God. The Lord God said it's not good for the man to be alone. So this is what he does. Go down to verse 21. In verse 21, it says, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. Who caused him to go to sleep? God. The Lord God. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs. Who took out one of the ribs? The Lord God took out his ribs. In verse 22, go to verse 22. The Lord God made a woman. Who made the woman? And then who brought her to the man? Check this out. God says it's not good for Adam to be alone. God put Adam to sleep. God took his rib. God built Eve. Then God brought Eve to Adam. God was all over this relationship. And even though, here's my point, even though this marriage was made in heaven, it still had problems. See, some of you think because your relationship has problems that God wasn't in it. The devil is a lie. God, problems in every marriage. If you ain't got no problems in your marriage, you just ain't been married long enough. Anybody been married long enough with significant time that tells you they ain't got no marriage problems? Let me tell you what their real problem is. They got a lying problem. Ain't nobody married without problems. That marriage was made in heaven. God was all over that marriage, and they had documented Domestic violence in the family. No cable TV, no gangster rap, no bad community. They were the community. They were the neighborhood. Homicide right in the family. They are t that whole conversation with Satan was out of order. <laughs> Bible says in chapter 3 that at Eve was, was going to always be fighting Adam over authority. There's tension all in this marriage and God put it together. Because even God's pick will not be perfect. Ooh, I need to say that to somebody. Listen to me. Even God's pick for you will not be perfect. You know why? Because you ain't either. And we got this, we got this notion. See, we, we don't want, we can say, I want, what's, I want what's, what's just right for me. What's just right for you will not be perfect. And so what we need is not perfection. What we need is commitment. That's what you need to be married. You got to be committed. We don't have commitment now. We want comfort, but it takes commitment to stay married. You got to be committed to, I ain't even talking about love because the love can get funny. I'm talking about you committed when you don't even like each other. 
Can't stand you, but I ain't going nowhere. Y'all ain't ready to talk to me in here today. You can't tell me somebody been married 30, 40, 50, 60 years and they ain't always liked each other. No, I tell them, you, you give me butterflies. You don't give me butterflies, you make me want to throw up. But I ain't going nowhere. See, if you ain't ready for that, you ain't ready for marriage. See, the problem is a lot of people don't have what Adam had. Adam had, we like, Adam's a, Adam's a role model. Adam has skin in the game. Yeah, yeah. Look at verse 23. Adam has skin in the game. And the reason why people are jumping out of marriage is because they ain't got no skin in the game. But Adam teaches us in verse 23 that Eve didn't just come from his bones. We know she came from his bones because he lost a rib over her. <laughs> he, she was built with a rib. But he also says she's not just bone on my bones. She's also what? She's flesh in my flesh. My skin is in this game. So she got her texture from my skin. She got her frame from my bones, but she got her texture from my skin. You can't even get to my bones without cutting my skin. You got to cut my epidermis, and then you got to cut through the dermis level. Then you got to cut through the subcutis to get to my rib. It cost me, and if you're going to graft, if you ever had skin grafted, it leaves a mark right there, and that mark is a reminder of what I invested in this relationship. I got some skin in this game, and some of y'all are willing to quit because you ain't got no skin in the game. You go in the mirror saying, I dare you to do something. Your name ain't on this house. You ain't got your name on nothing around here. This is my house. And that's what's wrong with you. That's why nobody want to stay with you. Because as soon as something go bad, you start talking about, you draw the line and say, this mine, that's mine. You can get out. That ain't marriage. You got your money at the credit union. She got her money in her bra and down in the basement in a shoebox. <laughs> y'all, y'all ain't got nothing together. You ain't put nothing on the table. You got nothing that's at risk. So it's easy to walk away. I got enough prenuptial engagements. You can leave now, Slim. But you said in front of everybody at the wedding who had to buy outfits to go to the joint that I'm with you forever till death. Well, how'd you get out alive? Who I ain't scared of y'all. I ain't scared of none of y'all. How you get out alive? How you not dead and you divorced? Oh, here we go. You ain't dead. You just see somebody, I know he ain't talking to me. <laughs> Pastor, what's skin in the game? We got children together. I don't even care if they're blood. They're my kids too. They keep you up at night, I'm up with you. See, y'all ain't ready for that. These are our grandkids. These are our great-grandkids. This is our house. This is our funds. We had tragedy together. We had triumphs together. We have trials together. We have suffered together. We have life together. I got too much in this to walk away from this. See, you got to have some skin in the game. It's easy to walk out when your skin ain't in it. So we go in it saying, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm hey, okay. That's how we go in <laughs> Oh, so that's how it is? Just tell me now. Just tell me now. You ain't trying to be married. See, we, we like the story of Adam. We like the cute parts of Adam. Adam was all in, rib and skin. What you got in it? You got a 401k in it? A thrift savings plan? Which, what's, what's, on the, what's on the line? Ain't nothing on the line. As long as you act right and I act right, this will work. Ain't nobody going to always act right. That's what we do by nature is act up. Ooh, I, y'all shouldn't have came to this service. This is the last one. I'm going to shoot every bullet I got in this gun. Brrr, I'm, about to shoot. <laughs> I'm about to take the Uzi out on y'all in this gun. I just need to, I just need to know I had enough in me. I'm about to empty this joint on y'all. Skin. Speaking of skin, verse 25 says, they were both naked and neither of them had any shame. They're naked. 
and they're not ashamed. It's a difference between being naked and being open. It's a difference between being naked and being vulnerable. Transparency is deeper than nudity. Because you can have your clothes off and still have your soul covered. I can be naked and you still not know who I am. Because who I am is under my skin. And in a world that worships bodies so much, that women are buying butts and breasts, it's, it's hard to even get to know who you are. Because, oh... We ain't throwing shade. We ain't throwing shade because everybody want to throw shades. We follow the pictures of everybody that bought one. But it must be a real empty life for people to see you and not know you. Because underneath everybody is a person and a story and a journey and a reason. And when it says they were naked with no shame, that can't just be about clothes. What is it like to just be seen? This is who I am. And under every body, no longer how old the body is, there's always a little girl and a little boy under that skin. She's always there and he's always there. But not even marriage will always bring it out. Because that girl and that boy only comes out in a context where it's safe. And if I ever bring him out or bring her out and you don't treat him right or her right, you will never see him or her again. You'll see me, but you won't see me. Who can y'all handle this today? You you won't see me. Because if you ever get burned on a hot stove, it'll always change the way you cook. You will never see that again. So how do you get, I'm not trying to tell you what to do if you're single, but I'll tell you this, what's right for you has got to be somebody that you can be vulnerable with. Like we can be vulnerable and know each other and still love each other. I mean, really know each other. Let me give you four questions to ask to take the relationship deeper and I'm done. Did I keep you too long? If y'all come out in the cold, I'm going to give you my best. I didn't think y'all was coming today. I told, I, told, I told our pastor, I said, they ain't coming today. It's too cold. Y'all ain't playing no games. Here, here we go. First question is, you, you got to be willing to ask these questions and answer them. You can't just be getting information. What are you willing to share? First question is, what are your greatest fears? What scares you? What are you afraid of? I know you want to put your best foot forward with the person you're dating, and it's like a job interview, and you're trying to show them your accomplishments, and this is what I've done and all that. It's like, but the right one's going to have to have, see the other foot too. They had to be able to see what you're afraid of without judging you for it or laughing at you. I'm really afraid of that. I am deeply afraid horrified of that. Second question is, what are your greatest flaws? What are you bad at? Everybody's out here trying to show what they're good at. This is my credit score. We hide all the bad stuff. If, you got, if your credit score is 300, don't you know if you don't share that, it's going to come out? Hiding is hard. It would be better to say, man, I am terrible with money. I have always been terrible with money. You say, well, you know what? That's good to know. Money is very important to me. Let me woo-saw. Are you willing, are we willing to work together on it? Like, see, the reason why flaws are so important is because I need to tell you my next question is, what are your failures? 
I've lost a lot of stuff. I've lost a lot of relationships. I lost a lot of trust because I'm so bad with this. See, your flaws feed your failures. See, Pastor, why would I tell somebody that? I might lose them. You have to care enough about yourself and the person you're in a relationship to say, I'm willing to lose you by letting you know this, but I'd rather tell you and lose you than to get you and you feel betrayed later that I never told you. There's some strong coffee today. (laughs) Otherwise, we're going to live as strangers, intimate strangers. We don't know each other. We've never had a conversation to go below the surface. I don't know what you're scared of. I don't know anything. I just know you're angry. Well, if you really knew me, you know where that anger comes from. Fear. I'm really afraid that you don't respect me. I was bullied as a kid, made fun of. So the way I handle that is I snap on people. I took karate not to get in shape. I took karate to beat somebody up. I'm a black belt. I went all the way to black belt to make sure if anybody ever crossed me, they would never be able to hurt me. You understand what I'm saying? That's my story. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm vulnerable to disrespect. Can we understand that? Can you... You, 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 you have to, you, to, 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 be, to be known and loved. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go deeper in this next week. To be known and loved, that's treasure. Because that's how God is. The final question is, what are your fantasies? What do you dream of? Where do you want to be? What are your aspirations? I'm going to park right here. I'm going to pick it up right here next week. This is what I'm going to say. I'm going to close with this. I think one of the hardest things in a marriage is to accept the gap between what we hope for and what we really have. (laughs) That's That's a mean gap right there. Between hope and reality. What you hoped your spouse would be. The marriage you hoped you would have. Let me tell you something. Everybody's got hopes. But when your reality and hope, that space in there, that's tough. That's tough. And when you, it becomes tougher when you watch TV and movies all the time because in Hollywood, there are no gaps. All gaps are replaced with people who have no gaps. So all those love stories are gapless. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. And they just say, oh, they're so perfect. They're so perfect. It looked, uh, it's fake. It's entertainment. <laughs> and then we have a world of video games now where if you don't like the players you have on your video game team, you can create a player. Right, right. Am, I, am I right, Spencer? You can create a player. You can make him a 99.9. He can be fast, athletic, can tackle. Can, he can be a quarterback, running back, kick returner, defensive back. He can play point guard and center. He got a 75-inch vertical leap and take off from half court and dunk <laughs> while flipping. So you can, create, you can create a perfect player. So you live in a world where if you don't like something, you can digitally make it better. But you live with somebody who's not perfect. So you feel the solution is, I need to find somebody else. Because you believe if God was in it, it would have been perfect. And I'm telling you, God gave Adam somebody that was imperfect. Both of them were imperfect. And if you keep quitting on everything, and you keep breaking up with everybody, and you keep blocking everybody, and you keep unfriending people, and you keep turning your back and canceling everybody, you're going to turn around and find out that there's imperfection everywhere, especially when you look in the mirror. <laughs> Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that your plans for us are not to harm us. Your plans for us are to bless us and to do good to us. We want what is just right for us. 
And I pray, Lord, that we would accept it and embrace it and be grateful for it and not get caught up in comparison traps that make us complain over what we should be grateful for. In Jesus' name, amen.